Happy February. It started raining again. Feels more like winter in Portland. Um, I have your scantrons. I will distribute them after class. I'll try and finish a couple minutes early so that people want to pick them up, they can do that. Uh, <clears throat> first, actually, a major mea culpa, as some of you, at least a lot of you who had exam C noticed, that I duplicated nine questions. In the process, I deleted nine questions that were on the other two versions of the exams. That means that everybody who did the version A and version B got nine bonus questions that were not graded. Woohoo! Just what you always wanted. Um, so the only fair way to grade everybody is to grade everybody on the same questions. So that means that those nine questions are thrown out as far as grading is concerned. But of course, it's all about learning, right? It's not about you know, doing well on the test. So it's great that you had all of those questions. Um, so that means that basically the high score would have been 41, except for the fact that I didn't put a palindrome as an answer to the palindromic question. And I'm, again, mea culpa maxima volte. Um, so that means it's actually out of 40 total. But that even being said, um, the high score was 37. So there were three extra questions. So I normalize that to 100%. And then I scale from there. So you can take your number of correct questions, ignoring those nine that I'm not scoring, and then um, you can scale to see about where you are. So any questions about this aspect of things? So again, my, my mistake here, I have applied for sabbatical so that I can actually relax a little bit <laughs> next year, and maybe next time this won't happen. OK, yeah. Yeah, the, the, well, the score you have on D2L, it will give you a percentage, which you know, may or may not end up matching these things. So um, I think I did have it that way, but um, just you know, take a look at it. And this is also the minimum that you would get. If it turns out that the person who got 37, and actually there's only one of you and you know who you are, uh, that person also ends up you know, maxing out on all of the other exams, I actually will normalize to a slightly lower number. So this, you know, outliers. Yeah? So the actual score is, what, is what's going to matter. So no, the ABCD, just ignore that. This is what makes sense. So yeah, no, D2L does a very strange sort of grading thing. Um, and I've tried to actually get rid of it. Um, if somebody has a good idea how to do that, let me know, because it makes no, has no resemblance to the way I end up grading. OK, another thing that I do is I try and go through questions that a lot of people missed, which probably means I did a bad job of explaining them. So it means I have yet another opportunity to go ahead and do that. So the first one of these was mass spectrometry. And you may notice um, I've emphasized um, a word here. That was not in the exam, but um, this is really sort of the take-home message here. And so how can a mass spectrometry be used to determine the primary structure of a protein? Primary structure is sequence, amino acid sequence. How do you get amino acid sequence from mass spectrometry? The way you do that is by breaking down peptides in the mass spectrometer which gives you those individual nucleotides in the sequence of, uh, sorry, nucleotides, amino acids, individual amino acids and how their sequence comes together. So that's determining the primary structure. So that's what the question was asking. And evidently I didn't do a good enough job of explaining this the first time around. Second one, um, oh, by the way, these are things that 75 to 80% of the people miss, which again probably means that I didn't do a good job of explaining them the first time around. Um, second one, polynucleotide kinase has which of the following activities? Adds a nucleotide, da 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 da. So, kinase, what does kinase mean? Add a phosphate. So, you can get rid of three of these immediately. That gets you down to a 50 50 chance. So, even if you don't remember what uh, I talked about that time. Um, here is the polynucleotide kinase, um, actually adds the gamma phosphate of ATP 
to five prime ends of DNA. Okay, but yeah, so look for keywords, primary structure, kinase, um, et cetera. And then the last one, um, which I guess I didn't talk about well enough at the end, had to do with histone code readers. Um, modifying histone tails mostly interact with which of the following? And the, the correct answer here is other proteins. Um, and particularly those other proteins are the histone code readers. All of these little grabby things here interacting with the modified histones on each of these tails. I did talk about acetylation and acetylation, you know, changing the positive charge in terms of interactions with DNA, but that's only one of the modifications and that's only one of the things that those lysines seem to be involved in. So acetylation is only one of those things. So if you have other questions on specific things about the exam, feel free to email me. I will post them. A little discussion right before class about the Watson and Crick paper. Uh, the question was about how many re figures there were in the paper. And in the paper, there was one. On the printout, there are actually three images, but the next two are from Rosalind Franklin. And it's the next paper after the Watson and Crick paper. Okay, so the histone code reader is actually a great lead in to the continuation of talking about histones, histones modification, chromatin. And then we're going to sort of rewind a little bit and talk about DNA replication. But first, I wanted to talk a little bit about this whole idea of histone modification and what happens when you have any of these particular histone modifications. And maybe I should back up one here first and emphasize that there are lots of little blue dots here hanging off of the nucleosomes. And that means that there are lots of modifications. And one nucleosome is not necessarily going to have exactly the same modification as the next one. And always are going to have combinations of modifications. So just looking at histone H3, this is a cartoon of histone H3 here. These are all of the different known modifications. And actually, this is out of date. There are other modifications that are known here as well to side chain amino acids that can happen and have actually been known to happen with these histone modifications. So combinations of these, some have them, some don't, et cetera. One thing importantly to mention is that when you're looking at a lysine, you can either methylate it or you can acetylate it. You can't have both at the same time. So acetylation or methylation. Acetylate and methylation are going to be happening on our Ks, on our lysines, and on our arginines. But you also have phosphorylation, and phosphorylation is going to happen on the serines, sometimes threonines as well. So people had seen, researchers have seen that there are lots of these modifications. Actually, we're getting really good. You can look at modifications all the way through the human genome at any given time in any given cell type and identify what histone modifications are present at that part of the chromatin at any particular time. And what they found is, is in many cases, and these are the best understood ones, if you have trimethylation at lysine 9 of histone H3, so this will be you know, K9H3 trimethyl, we'll look at it in just a second, this is very closely associated with heterochromatin and gene silencing. Now my pointer has just decided to die on me. Um, so <clears throat> this is what happens uh, with many cases, but not all of them. Then if you have acetylation at K9, but also methylation at K4, this is correlated with gene expression. And again, these are just correlations, you know, whether they're causations or not. And we'll talk much more about what these things are actually doing later on when we talk about gene regulation. You can also have trimethylation at lysine 27 that also leads to gene silencing, but not heterochromatin formation. So one of the questions is actually really twofold. First, how do you get these modifications in the first place? And then 
once you have them, how are they maintained or transmitted? I mentioned this a little bit last time, but that was before the exam, so we've all forgotten about it. So <clears throat> how do you get histone modification in the first place? Usually this happens because you have binding of some sequence-specific DNA binding protein that's a gene regulatory protein. And as will kind of sound like a broken record, probably for the rest of the class, you have protein-protein interactions. And those protein-protein interactions between this gene regulatory protein are often with some kind of histone modifying enzyme. So this could be a histone acetyl transferase, so puts acetyl groups onto histones, or histone methyl transferase, which puts methyl groups on it. It could be a histone kinase that puts phosphates on it. It could be a histone ubiquitin transferase, which will put ubiquitin onto the histones. So modifies one of the histone side chains. And then in this case, you know, since we're dimeric in this um, case, all of these, so histone H3, for instance, there'll be two modifications. Then you know, this will interact with another protein. And what happens in many cases is that just one of these modifications isn't enough. You need multiple modifications. And so you have these reader proteins that are also connected to the enzymes that make the modification. So you make a modification, that modification is recognized, it then modifies the next histone, which modifies the next histone in the next nucleosome, next histone in the next nucleosome, etc. And in this process, you can have one event here, the modification by the gene regulatory protein, which then leads to modification of all of the nucleosomes in the same area. And this is really well known for the formation of heterochromatin, and we'll talk a lot more about heterochromatin later on, particularly, again, we talk about gene silencing and to some extent about the X chromosome. If you have trimethylation at lysine 9 and histone H3, very closely tied to heterochromatin formation, we actually do know that this functions in this way. So histone methyltransferase will methylate your histone, histone H3. Your read writer complex will methylate the histones on the next nucleosome, so on and so forth. Also, it turns out that you need chromatin remodeling complexes here to move the nucleosomes around or move the DNA relative to the nucleosome, depends on your point of view. And then this will continue. This formation of heterochromatin is really a compaction of the chromatin. And that compaction of the chromatin leads to not being accessible for other DNA binding proteins. So if you have heterochromatin, that's going to not allow other DNA binding proteins, and particularly the DNA-dependent RNA polymerase, which is doing all the transcription, will not be able to access that part of <clears throat> your chromatin. This leads to an obvious problem. It's a positive feedback loop. So you make methylation, that makes more methylation, makes more methylation, makes more methylation. You don't want to silence your complete chromosome. You want to have some way of stopping this. And the way that these things stop are so-called barrier proteins. And we've talked a little bit about these already. In fact, people in office hours asked me a little bit about this as well. Um, so <clears throat> these are literally doing exactly like what they sound. They're stopping the progression of nucleosome modification. Could be blocking heterochromatin, could actually be blocking some other kind of modification that's happening. And there are basically three different ways that this works. One of them, and actually probably the most common of them, is where you have a protein that is physically bound to some part of the nucleus and bound to the DNA. And when we talked about the nuclear scaffold, this is one of these kinds of proteins. And this protein literally doesn't allow all of these modifying proteins to keep going. And so it will isolate this particular piece of DNA from the rest of your DNA. And I should say chromatin, this piece of chromatin from the rest of your chromatin. So this is, again, probably the way that most of these actually happen. And when we talk more about the supranucleosomal structures in just a second, 
we'll see that there are some specific proteins that do this, um, and some in, in more cases than this as well. So <clears throat> another way that this happens is in just literally blocking the access of these modifying enzymes to the nucleosomes. And then the last of them, and this is the one which is much more regulatory, will be a protein which has enzymatic activity. And the way the book likes to show enzymatic activity is these nice little you know, pink arrows here. So if you had a histone acetyltransferase, it's going to be putting acetyl groups onto your histones in the nucleosomes. A histone deacetylase will take them off. And so if you have a histone deacetylase that binds to DNA in a specific location, then it will block any more of these transfers. So it could also be a histone demethylase, for instance, which will then take methyl groups off if they're being added. So this is the way that you can prevent this, you know, literally sort of like a positive feedback loop, although it's running its way along your chromatin, from getting out of control and separating different pieces of DNA in the nucleosome from each other. And that's going to be very important when we talk more about regulation later on. Yeah? So the first one, the, the purple one up at the top, basically, the question is, how is that causing this blockage? It literally just seems to be a physical block. It's a part of the nucleus, a structure inside the nucleus. In this case, it's the nuclear pore, but it could be other kinds of protein structures that are inside the nucleus that that protein binds to, and the other proteins literally run into it. Okay, other questions on these, these kinds of modifications? Yeah. So how do the barrier proteins get added to the DNA? So we'll talk a little bit more about this when we talk about gene regulation later on. Uh, many of these, so in this case, the barrier protein binds to some structure in the nucleus and then also binds to a specific DNA sequence or sometimes actually a specific DNA structure that it will interact with. In this case, these two cases, they're usually some kind of sequence-specific DNA binding protein that will associate. And particularly in this case down here, these kinds of proteins are often regulated. So they'll be turned on or turned off, meaning that you'll block the transmission of whatever chromatin modifications in some cases, but not in others. Yeah, and in some cases, yeah, just the presence of one of these proteins. So for instance, in one cell type, you'll make this protein. In other cell types, you won't. So just presence, absence kind of thing. Yeah, right in the corner. Yeah, this third one right down here at the bottom. So this is enzymatic activity. And so the, again, the little red or pink, I don't know how they come across on your screen, little arrows here. And whenever we see this in the textbook, this is supposed to represent some kind of enzymatic activity. So there's the enzymatic activity that happens when you have modification of the histones. So putting on methyl groups, putting on acetyl groups, putting on phosphates, putting on ubiquitin. And then this has the opposite enzymatic activity. So if what's coming along is going to be methylation, it will take those methyl groups off. And if it takes the methyl groups off, you're not going to have binding by the histone code reader, which is not going to give you more writing. Yeah? Oh, so um, the the question here, if I'm, I'm understanding you correctly, let me get this to work. Um, turn back, back, back. It's not moving for me now. How nice. Okay. Um, <clears throat> but yeah, so the um, histone code reader, histone code writer uh, complex, the question is, are they bouncing on and off of the DNA? Um, the answer seems to be yes, they do seem to be bouncing on and off of the DNA, or literally on the proteins, because they're interacting with the proteins. Um, what happens actually next, great lead into the next slide, thank you, um, is that you'll then have another protein which will then bind to that, um, that modification. So the enzymes are usually just present in relatively small amounts. So you'll have the reader that will then interact with the writer, 
that will happen. You have the modification, then you'll have another protein that binds to that. Then you'll continue and move on from there. So, you have a question or a stretch? <laughs> Okay, so um, great, again, the lead-in to this one is, so what happens when you have these modified histones, you'll have stable binding proteins that just bind to them. These are no longer enzymes. They're not something which is a specific, you know, read-writer complex, just bound. And there's actually a very specific protein called HP1, the heterochromatin protein, that binds to methylated histones in nucleosomes. So you have some parts of your genome, then there will be a barrier of some kind, and then non-modified nucleosomes or modified in a way such they're not compacted. Then what can happen is this state of the chromatin, so the modified nucleosomes, these can actually be inherited from generation to generation. So this is kind of funky. It's like, wait a minute, you know, inheritance is the genetic material, right? That's what we had on the exam, you know, genetic material. How do they figure out what's the genetic material? Um, so, but it turns out you can inherit the state of your DNA, not just the sequence of your DNA. When I say the state of your DNA, compacted, non-compacted, heterochromatin, euchromatin, which is the expanded form of chromatin. And the way that that works is exactly the same way that you got these spreading of nucleosome modifications in the first place. So after you have chromosome duplication, you'll have nucleosomes that have modified histones associated with them, some that won't have modified nucleosomes associated with them, but they'll be next to ones that had modified nucleosomes with them. Those will be bound by code readers and writers and so on and so forth. The barrier is still a barrier. So even after you have chromosome duplication, you end up with heterochromatin in the same place, euchromatin in the same place, and so on and so forth. Unless there's some kind of change, like the barrier protein, you know, where your barrier protein is, is it expressed in that certain cell type, et cetera. So this is um, an example, the first example that we'll talk about of epigenetic inheritance. So it's cell to cell modification, so cell to cell replication, not just the genetic material, not just the DNA, not that content, but what that DNA had in it that will still determine what you get in that next cell. Um, kind of funky thing to think about, um, but it's clearly quite functional. So this just sort of leads to the idea that even when we've gone from that fertilized egg that we looked at you know, way back at the beginning of class, through to that final organism, many of those cell divisions will end up giving you a particular lineage. So, you know, the beginnings of a heart, all of those kinds of cells end up with the same kind of chromatin in them. All the cells are going to turn into stomach end up with the same kind of chromatin modifications with them as well, even though they've got identical DNA sequences to each other. So part of what's giving you the heart being the heart and the stomach being the stomach have to do with these kinds of changes. And they're maintained because of these feedback loops. Okay. More questions on chromatin. Everybody's grabbing their um, clickers. Yeah, I've got you well trained. <laughs> so <clears throat> production of messenger RNA mRNA messenger RNA from a gene package in nucleosomes is lowered when, which, when the nucleosomes are which of the following? Are in beads in a string state, lack histone H1, contain histone H3 with three methyl groups on lysine 9, contain histone H2B with a phosphate group on serine 14, contain histone H4 with a phosphate group on serine 1. And again, we're going for 100% here. <clears throat> 10, 
five. Okay, we haven't quite hit our 80% threshold, so tell your neighbors what you selected and why. I'm trying to. <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> I don't know. People are still talking. This is great. Hopefully learning in the process. Or they're talking about what they're going to do for the weekend. <laughs> also a possibility. So are we ready to go again? Quick. Go. <clears throat> go ahead. <laughs> Ten. Five. We are so close, so close. What four more until we're till we're there? So, some point we will get to one hundred percent. Okay, so I want to talk a, a little bit about some. <clears throat> Alternatives here. Oh, this is strange. It's working too. Um, <clears throat> so yes, you have histone modifications, and you know, histone modifications are great because they're reversible. You can have you know, different modifications in different places, but it turns out that there also are some alternative histones. And what I mean by alternative histones, these are histones that are present in nucleosomes in very specific parts of the genome that usually are not going to be things that are going to be modified as quickly as, say, when you have a modification, methylation, acetylation, etc. These all have the histone fold, which is, as you all remember, I'm sure, are those three alpha helices that kind of wrap and round each other, forming dimers. Uh, but they have different N-terminal tails, sometimes different C-terminal tails, and in a few cases, some modifications that happen in between. This histone fold is how the histones are interacting with each other. It's those extra pieces that are hanging out, which are going to be slightly different. The only one that we really want to concentrate on in this class is the centromere-specific histone H3. So it's a histone H3 that is also called sen 
key A, so centromere protein A. Again, these molecular biologists have ridiculously fun naming procedures. Um, that associates with DNA in centromeres, then has a specific N-terminal tail that, again, just like all of these other N-terminal tails, interacts with other proteins. In this case, they're proteins that are important for forming the structure that allows his, um, chromosomes to be segregated in mitosis. So moving chromosomes back and forth um, through the microtubules and kinetic core complex. So this happens, happens through the same kind. So when you get these in the first place, it's going to be a histone assembly process. There'll be nucleosome, so say histone chaperones, there probably will be chromatin remodeling complexes that are also involved in putting in these extra histones. So we've talked about double-stranded DNA, again, way back before the midterm, beads on a string form of chromatin, this is in the absence of histone H1, very open chromatin, 30 nanometer filament, where they're packed on top of each other. Now I want to talk a little bit more about some of these later stages of chromatin compaction. The first one are these loops. We talked a little bit about the loops last time. These loops down at the bottom here very often have those barriers and barrier proteins associated with them. So these are the things that are attached to the nuclear scaffold. So you know, your question that you had about where those barrier proteins are. Um, almost always down at the bottom of each of these extended loop structures. Then you'll have these loop structures associated with each other. And a lot of this is just, again, as we talked about right at the beginning, we started talking about chromatin. DNA is pretty darn inefficient because it's only got four nucleotides. It's really long. You have to compact it. And so that compaction process is very important. And particularly when you talk about a metaphase chromosome, this is incredibly compacted, um, literally about 10,000 fold shorter than when you started um, in the first place with just your B-form DNA. So how does this work? How do you get all of this condensation taking place? Again, we talked about nucleosomes, nucleosome modifications, barrier proteins that also help with these loop structures. And until very recently, it wasn't known how you got these next little steps happening. But literally, um, actually last year, there was a nice publication we'll take a look at in just a second here, where people figured out how these things are getting compacted, again, into metaphase chromosomes. So during mitosis, when you have chromosomes compacting, uh, you have the presence of these proteins. These are the so-called condensin proteins, also known as SMC. I wouldn't worry about that. These have ATP hydrolysis, but basically they're a ring structure. And we'll see lots of ring structures as we move forward, particularly in terms of DNA replication. So rings are great because they grab things and can hold things together, but they're not doing any particular kinds of modification in the process. It's a pretty non-specific process of getting these ring structures. So ring structures, Closing the ring structures depends on having ATP. <clears throat> and literally what these do is they hold these loops of DNA together, <clears throat> particularly during condensation, condensin, of metaphase chromosomes. Um, and it's that pulling everything together. Also, these ATPases, almost all of the ring structures that we look at, closing rings, you need ATP hydrolysis for them. Turns out that there are actually two of these, condensins one and condensins two. They're very similar to each other, probably gene duplication, definitely part of a gene family. Um, and when you just look at where they are in metaphase chromosomes, and this is done by antibody staining. So you have an antibody to condensins one and two, take a metaphase chromosome, and you'll notice they're right in the middle of these metaphase chromosomes. And it turns out that condensin 1 is important for keeping those loops together. And then condensin 2 stacks all of these loops on top of each other in order to get the metaphase chromosome structure. And there's a really nice animation here, which you can look at once you don't look at my kids, um, <clears throat> which is from the Howard Hughes Medical Institute and is looking at one of these metaphase chromosome structures, you know, decompressing it here from either end. 
they're all these looped structures. And at the ends of those loops are these condensin rings. And we've got two kinds of condensins. Condensin 2, which again forms this structure right in the very middle. This is what's holding all of the loops together. And then in just a second, we'll see where condensin 1 comes into the picture. These are just those individual loops built up on the outside. In these loop structures, now you also have condensin 1 that pulls individual pieces of those loops together. They call them nested loops here. So it's loops inside the loops. And those then you know, line up again right in the middle, and you have your compacted chromosome with all of these looped structures. And a lot of this comes because we have really good electron microscopy, lots of really good imaging tools, and literally this came out last year, um, beginning of last year, almost exactly a year ago, um, this, was, this was published. So we can go back to <clears throat> keynote and continue. So that's what happens in all metaphase chromosomes. What happens in interphase chromosomes? Metaphase is really fascinating and interesting from a cell biology point of view. From a molecular biology point of view, it's really boring because it's all this massively compacted DNA that nothing can happen to. It just gets split into new cells and then you go on from there. So we're going to ignore metaphase chromosomes for the rest of the class. We're just going to talk about what's going on in interphase, which is the cool and interesting part of the cell cycle as far as I'm concerned. I'm a little biased here. But, um, so if you want to look at interphase chromosomes, what's going on there? Now, it's a lot harder to look at interphase chromosomes because in most cases, they're far too small to see with regular kinds of light microscopy. Turns out they're exceptions. Biology is always full of exceptions. And some of those turn out to be really, really useful for looking at metaphase chromosomes. And one of those are these so-called lamp brush chromosomes. So lamp brush chromosomes are metaphase chromosomes, sorry, not metaphase chromosomes, interphase chromosomes, that are basically compacted not unlike what you're seeing at the beginning of compaction into metaphase um, chromosomes during, during mitosis. So these are interphase, they're actually actively being expressed. And these are multiple copies of the chromosomes that just literally line up right next to each other in these amphibian oocytes. And amphibian oocytes are great because they're huge, relatively speaking, in terms of lots of other oocytes. And they're transparent, so they're easy to look into microscopically. So this is why lots of people like to use um, amphibians, particularly frogs, um, for looking at all kinds of different aspects of what's um, happening here. The other thing with oocytes is as soon as the fertilized oocyte, first thing that needs to happen is you need to make lots of proteins really fast. So you're also very, very active in terms of their transcriptional activity. And what's seen with <clears throat> these lamp brush chromosomes is that some of these loops turn out to be really big relative to other loops which are really small. And we now know that these big loops are where genes are being transcribed, made into RNA. That RNA is then later made, onto, made to protein, whereas these loops down here are in regions of the chromosome that are actually not being made into protein. They're not being transcribed. And so when we talk about euchromatin, heterochromatin on a small scale, not talking about metaphase chromosomes here, this is really part of the data, so these are some of the data, which show that these are the non-compacted regions where you have expression, compacted regions you don't have expression. The other thing to bear in mind here is you'll notice all of these loops are attached down the bottom here. That's where you've got your barrier proteins, your scaffold proteins that are holding these loops separate from all of the other loops. So this is in interphase, again, these are amphibian oocytes, they're rather the exception rather than the rule, but very useful for looking at. Even more extreme are the Drosophila and actually lots of flies, some invertebrates here, salivary glands. Salivary glands are also where 
Many insects are producing very large quantities of different proteins. And what happens in the development of these particular salivary glands is instead of every time you undergo chromosome replication, each chromosome gets segregated into new cells, etc. Here they just stay after being replicated and all line up with each other. And so these are what are called polyteen chromosomes, just literally all lined up next to each other. And they've got these dark and light bands next to each other, particularly the light bands are where you have gene expression going on. And I say gene expression again, this is where you have RNA synthesis, RNA polymerase. And particularly if you've got a region which is undergoing gene expression at some time and not undergoing gene expression at other times, when it's not undergoing gene expression, it'll be like this. And as soon as it starts undergoing gene expression, there's these things that are called puffs. And literally it's a decondensation, it's the DNA coming apart so that you can have association of all of these other proteins with it. Um, in this particular protein here, um, all of these dots here, they represent RNA polymerase and the RNA polymerase which is associated with the DNA as it's being expressed here. Um, so decondensa decondensation of chromatin, gene expression. So you can literally see it in some of these cases. Again, these are exceptional cases. We'll look and see in some less exceptional cases in just a second here. So <clears throat> one thing relatively recent, probably the last 10, 15 years or so, that we started to realize is that people used to first think that the nucleus is a bag and all the DNA is just kind of floating around inside of it. Well, it turns out that's not the case that each of the individual chromosomes kind of has a place in the nucleus where it hangs out. And one of the ways that this was shown was with the same kind of hybridization technique with that fluorescent karyotype that I wasn't able to show you, even though there's a picture in the textbook, not quite sure how that happened, but it's specific pieces of DNA that have fluorescent tags on them that are specific to any individual chromosome. And if they, everything was mixed up together, and you did this kind of staining with these different colors, it would all be kind of sort of a grayish brown. But it turns out in pretty much all nuclei, if you do staining with these different chromosome stains, you see that they're separate from each other. Not that, you know, chromosome here, one copy of chromosome three is over here, one copy of chromosome three is over here. They're not always at, I guess that would be the northwest and mid-east part of the nucleosome, but they're separate. Each of the chromosomes is in a separate place, and they're separate. How they're kept in separate places is still a very open question, but they are in pretty separate places. Um, and that's, again, not what people thought was happening with what's going on in the nucleus. The other thing that we've now been able to see, it's a connection here is interesting, um, is that... <clears throat> If you look now at expressed genes, so this is just you know, one chromosome, there you have two copies of it here, and one expressed gene or one gene that you're interested in. So this pink dot right here represents a gene that we're interested in looking at when it's getting transcribed, i.e. DNA copy is going to RNA copy. What's Particularly interesting about this, if you look between a state where it's not being transcribed and a place where it is being transcribed, this part of that chromosome has moved pretty seriously compared to where that rest of the chromosome is. And so we think that means that, of course, it hasn't detached itself from the rest of the chromosome. It's still DNA. It's still connected. So there's one part of the chromosome that's clearly unwound itself and has this expressed gene, or gene that's been turned on in one particular part of the nucleus, and when it's turned off, this gene is where it belongs um, back in the rest of the chromosomes. So these parts of DNA that are being expressed actually literally move around in the nucleus. And that movement process seems to be to get that particular DNA to 
where you have all of your transcription complexes. So if you do the same thing with other chromosomes, what you will notice is the expressed genes are all sort of in this one particular area inside the nucleus. So there's an area in the nucleus where lots of transcription is happening. And you also will call these transcription factories. And we'll see, again, when we talk more about transcription, and particularly transcription regulation, there are a lot of proteins that are important for this process of making a DNA, taking a DNA and making it into an RNA copy. And we looked at the relative size of proteins relative to the size of DNA. It's actually a lot easier to move the smaller thing than it is to move the bigger thing. So you're probably moving the DNA around rather than getting the proteins associated with DNA, which is sort of the opposite of pretty much any animation or diagram that we look at, is you have the DNA solid and the proteins come to that. It's really much more the DNA going to the proteins rather than vice versa. Probably an active process, but that's not um, entirely clear. This is a quick review. Um, what we talked about particularly today in terms of chromosome organization, chromosomes end up in being specific regions in the nucleus. So chromosome 3 doesn't overlap with chromosome 22. Um, could be in different places, but they're <clears throat> not always overlapping. Non-expressed genes are in this compacted version of chromatin due to first modifications, but then DNA binding proteins that will associate with that. And then the actual expressed genes are very often in these looped out structures, moving themselves away from where the chromosome normally is to some other part of the nucleus where all the protein machinery is for doing its job. More questions? You have more questions? What am I going to do? Ask you a clicker question. So, <clears throat> oops, turn this on, that would help. <clears throat> the change in position of expressed genes in the nucleus is mostly thought to be due to which of the following? Diffusion, dissociation of histones from the DNA, movement to expression factories, formation of lamp brush chromosomes, or formation of the nuclear pore. Let's get 100. Ten, five. I swear you're teasing me. Seventy-seven percent. So, <laughs> discuss with your neighbors. Ma'am, we'll go from there. I'll give you a minute. Ready to go again? Yes. On our marks, get set, go. <clears throat> <clears throat> 
10, 5, So yes, you know, what is, it, what is this with this C thing? I think I overheard somebody say if they didn't know what the answer was in the exam, just pick C. Uh, <laughs> I try not to do that, but um, yes, it is you know, movement to these expression factories, which seems to be what's happening. How it happens, um, it's not dissociation of histones from DNA because there still are histones associated even when you have gene expression taking place. It's the euchromatin. And it's not the lamp brush chromosomes. That is a you know, very specific kinds of thing, again, that just happens in the <clears throat> excuse me, uh, amphibian oocytes. OK, so oops. now this is starting to work. <clears throat> Strange pointer. Uh, <clears throat> so last time, a little bit, we talked about histone modification. Um, continue to talk about histone modification this time. Again, the sort of the idea of the histone code. Um, one of your colleagues asked me after class a few weeks ago, I think it was a few weeks ago, maybe last week, uh, whether there was a nice you know, rule of thumb, you know, methylation leads to gene suppression or um, lack of gene expression. Acetylation leads to gene expression. No, it's a combination of both, and it's that combination of different changes which is associated with different things that happen in gene expression. Heterochromatin is this compacted state. Took a little bit about alternative histones, particularly is associated with nucleosomes, or not nucleosomes, with the centromere. Um, these loops, which are where you're getting gene expression, and as we'll see later, those loops are usually regulated differently, but very importantly, they're associated with scaffold. Um, and we saw that with the lamp brush chromosomes, and that does seem to be the case even in regular interphase nuclei. Epigenetic inheritance, of course, this is those feedback loops. And then localization. How localization happens, we really don't know. But we do see some kinds of movement from that when you have expressed genes. And then finally, metaphase compaction. So I want to really briefly remind everyone what's in the human genome. The main thing that we care about are these protein coding regions of the genome. Um, this is only about 1.5% of the human genome are these actual protein coding genes. So only 1.5% you know, of, of our DNA actually makes us what we are. Um, lots of introns in the genome. So a gene would also have these introns as well as the protein coding regions. Um, some regulatory regions, that's what this non-repetitive DNA part is here. The part that I care a lot about is these retroviral-like elements. This gray bar is about six times as big as this little red bar over here. So we're actually more viral than we are human. Interesting thing to think about here. And we'll talk about some of these other repeated elements a little bit later on. So it, this, the reason that I bring this up is A, because viruses rule, but B, because this whole you know, process of having coding sequence versus non-coding sequence, one of the reasons that this might be the case is just having a very small amount of protein coding sequence means that the likelihood that there's going to be DNA damage or mutations that changes protein sequence is actually pretty low if you think about it across your whole genome. Um, whereas you're still replicating your whole genome. So that's one possibility for why we have such big genomes. Let's talk about that replication process. Yeah, really small amount of sequence is actually coding for proteins, but you've got to make all the rest of your DNA. So potentially part of that has to do with mutations, and we'll spend a little while talking about mutations here. Replication itself is semi-conservative, so what that means is you hang on to one of the strands and you make one new one. We'll talk about that process and what it means. And then if we get to it today, which we probably won't, um, we'll talk a little bit about the actual mechanism. But I wanted to start out talking about mutations. So as I've, I think, probably mentioned many times, and I'll continue to mention it again, DNA is a really crummy molecule for having genetic information in it. 
So um, many, many, many changes can happen to DNA. Any chemical part of the DNA, and there are lots of different chemical parts, are subject to changes. Some of you have come and looked at my model, notice that there's a number of breaks that are in the backbone, classic kind of thing that happens. And if you look at just stable mutation rates, um, and that's a inherited change in the DNA, it's about one in a billion, which is, sorry, one, yeah, one in a billion in, in E. coli and also in humans. Now, you remember, we've got three billion base pairs in each of our haploid genomes. That means every time our genome replicates, there'll be three inherited mutations that happen. You go from one cell that you start out with to the multiple trillion cells that we are right now, we have a lot of changes that happen. Most of those are not in the germline, so we're not going to be passing them along. But there are lots and lots of changes that happen. And you can do some back-of-the-envelope math, and basically, given this mutation rate, there could be at most 50,000 essential proteins. And people actually use this for a long time and said, oh, in the human genome we're going to have, before the genome was sequenced, we'll have you know, 100,000 proteins or 50,000 proteins. And now, of course, we only get about 20,000 proteins in the human genome. Um, but just, you know, some of those processes. A lot of mutations, in fact, probably the mass majority of mutations, are deleterious, particularly if they're in some kind of protein coding sequence. And those will be eliminated through the wonderful process of evolution. Um, they will be uh, no longer maintained. That particular cell won't work anymore. Um, so that is great. Um, unfortunately, what happens in some cases is that some of those three mutations that you pick up every single cycle that's replicating can cause a mistaken replication of the cells, and that's what leads to cancer. Um, and these are happening, cancers happen in somatic cells. So this is not something that gets passed along from generation to generation, because they're not in the germline. But somatic cells are where you get cancer, and a lot of that is probably just because you're getting all of these mutations just literally through replication. <coughs> However, if we didn't have mutation, and this is probably uh, the saving grace of DNA and the fact that we do use DNA as our genetic mutation, and I say we, I mean all cellular organisms, is that if you didn't have mutations, evolution wouldn't be possible. So that's probably why we have that. So replication. How does replication work? It has not escaped our knowledge that. Where's that from? The question I didn't ask about the Watson and Crick paper. <laughs> so um, that they have this double-stranded structure, and they make the prediction that, oh, well, you can pull these two strands apart, it's redundant information, and you can copy each of them. And so that <clears throat> was what they predicted. There was, however, one big problem with that, and that was to do this, you've got to pull those strands apart. And how do you pull strands apart? And actually, it turns out that's probably one of the things that requires the most ATP hydrolysis and replication, is actually pulling the two strands apart. It's hard to do that. So, um, and when this happens, you have copying of each of the strands of DNA. So, let's move this out of the way. Um, five prime to three prime. Here's our one piece of DNA. This is the, um, the three prime. Make sure it actually matches up here. This was actually incorrect in one version of the textbook I looked at. Um, so, it's not just me who messes up with, you know, palindromes and things. And then, new strands are made. So, pull apart, five prime end. 3 prime to 5 prime, and 3 prime end, 5 prime to 3 prime. Each of these is copied. We'll see that this is a problem a little bit later on. Another way to look at this is here. We can get it to move. Um, <clears throat> just looking at different colors. And um, apologies here for those of us who are red, green, colorblind. My brother is. Um, where we go from Starting out with our DNA, here being two yellow stripes, two yellow strands, to a mixture of yellow and red. And this is what happens in the first generation. In the second generation, you have yellow, which gets copied, and all the copies here are green. Red gets copied into green. Red gets copied into green. And that first yellow one, here. 
So the semi-conservative is that one of these strands is maintained every single time as you go through. Now, now the bottom here, we've got our, our black ones. Now, this is great. It's a wonderful prediction. But how do you know that this is actually the correct way that DNA gets replicated? So one way of thinking about this is that each time you have replication, each of these new strands, in this case the red strand, in this case the green one, in this case the black one, is new and here in red. But you're not separating any of these strands when you do the analysis. And we'll, this is you know, how we're getting to Gieselson and Stahl's experiment here. So in the first generation, you have mixed new and old strands. In the second generation, you still have some mixed new and old strands, but you also have some just new. In the next generation, you have mixed old and new and a whole bunch of new and new strands. So why am I spending so much time thinking about this? Well, it turns out that there were, particularly at the time that Miesel and Stahl did these experiments, a number of other models for how DNA could replicate. One of these was the so-called conservative replication mechanism. And this was a great way to undergo replication because you didn't have to pull those strands apart. And all the genetic information that you need is in the major group of DNA. So if you had a way of basically using this as a template, instead of making a negative of that template and then using that to make more of your DNA, there's no reason why that shouldn't work. But it would give you a very different output in terms of what kinds of DNA molecules you would get. So your parental DNA molecule, again, old, old. But here you'll have conservative. You hang on to this old DNA and you just make a copy from this template. Here, you just make a copy from that template. In this process, you end up with always having your original DNA here and then three copies of your new DNA. The other way you can think about how DNA replication could take place is mixing and matching different little pieces. And this actually, as we talk about next week, is how DNA repair works. So bits and pieces of DNA get copied. And so here, the idea is you have your parental DNA molecule and just bits of it get copied. So a little bit gets copied here, half and half is copied, Again, half and half of that is copied, so you end up with one-third and one-fourth of your DNA. These were the three models that were going to be tested by Mieselson and Stahl. And so that's outlined here. And the big question was how to differentiate all of these you know, red and black mixed, red and black just by themselves, or both two colors at the same time. And the way that was done was equilibrium centrifugation, which we talked about when we talked about protein purification already. Um, cesium chloride gradient, where you have different densities of your DNA. The way Mises installed this experiment, they started with heavy and they moved to light. And they just literally looked to see where these densities of the DNA were, going from heavy to light. In model one, semi-conservative, you start out down here, you end up with a mixture and then light. If it's conservative, you always have the heavies and more and more light. If it's dispersive, you end up with progressively lighter and lighter DNAs. And we'll talk about their actual data generated with the big machine next week. Have a good weekend.